good evening and thank you for joining us on this sunny September evening. Uh, this is the first of our uh, free speech webinars uh, and we'll be meeting the brilliant Simon Hamilton in just a moment. Um, we'll be looking at these over the next few months so keep an eye out and if you want to have your turn do let us know after. Um, so just by way of introduction Simon is the youngest of five children and has been involved in the built environment now for just over 30 years or 30 years or so. Uh, he, during that time he's worked with architects and suppliers and he now has his own design company which has taken him all over the world. As with many of us at the start of lockdown Simon found himself on a webinar but unlike a number of people watching this webinar Simon realised he was the only black person in the virtual room which got him thinking why is he so often the only person in the room virtual or otherwise who is non-white in an industry which is known for its creativity openness and liberalism so if I can just introduce or welcome Simon um, and he can tell us a bit more. Okay, um, hello everybody and uh, thank you for joining um, this webinar. I'm just going to um, say that it's been a great opportunity to, um, to be able to talk about myself and my experiences in design and built environment, as Kelly said. And what I want to do is just give you a little bit of background, to talk to you about how I've um, progressed through my career and also just give some ideas about what can be done and what is being done in the industry. So um, here we go. And if you're obviously if you've got any questions, please do put those into the chat and I can answer those either as you go or um, at the end. So um, thank you. Hello everyone. So as Kelly said, yeah, I'm the youngest of five. I was born to black parents who originally came from Jamaica, um, grew up in North London, 70s and 80s, went to school because um, my parents went to school in Edmonton. My parents moved house. We used to live in Southgate and then we went to uh, um, Edmonton because my parents were told that their property was going to be redeveloped, which never actually happened. So we moved from a beautiful four story Georgian mansion, really, to a uh, two story 1930s villa for, you know, seven people. That's quite a squeeze. Um, my brothers and sisters, two brothers and two sisters, they went to, they carried on going to the same school, which was actually quite grim. It was quite racist and not supportive and, and really quite a negative experience. But because I happened to be in the catchment area of Enfield, I ended up going to a completely different school and schools and had a fantastic education and that changed my life completely and I think it's affected me since then. Um, so um, I would say that here yeah, a picture of my family, my mum, my sister, brother, sister, brother, that's me there, um, all looking lovely and innocent. And yeah, here's me as a student. Um, so I've always been somebody that has been very um, sociable, collaborative, got on with everybody. Colour hasn't been an issue for me, certainly not in my younger years. So, um, yeah, that kind of is my life. I, I always had an art interest in art. I took a foundation course at Middlesex in London, Middlesex Polytechnic it was called then. And I studied interior design on a four year BA interior design degree and graduated in 1988. I came back to London to uh, work for interior designers, but my main design career started when I worked for architects in Kensington High Street on large commercial office projects. And um, this is when I graduated, as my mum and me, me smiling rather widely and beaming. But as you can see, again, <laughs> quite early on, I was the only sort of non-white person in the, the group there. It wasn't an issue, but it's something that now I'm kind of aware of more so graduating very proudly with my kind of um, gown, etc. But some of the highlights I've had during my career have been some things that have been really quite um, significant in some ways because I was twice elected to the voluntary role of international director for the British Institute of Interior Design, which is a body of interior designers. And it really exists to promote the professionalism of designers and the uh, broadly kind of 
knowledge and experience of designers. So I was lucky enough to travel to lots of different countries, Europe, Japan, Canada, Russia, India, and the USA talking about design. And that was fantastic. And I did that whilst I was also working for myself. So it was one of those things that you did as a voluntary thing, but worked out really well. And other things I've done in 2017, I was elected to be an ambassador for Decorex um, as part of their 40th anniversary. And I've also been a judge for the International Property Awards since 2014, something that I really continue and proud of doing. So I've had quite a few highlights and I really think that's something that has come out has come out from, from being uh, somebody that's really um, been given really a good start and good opportunities from the, the get-go. Um, but here I am at a design show on my own, <laughs> um, looking a bit sad. <laughs> Um, but I've been to lots of different events where I've been with colleagues and again, you know, sharing ideas, sharing experiences, but not being somebody that seen other black faces or other non-white faces. Milan and um, other international events as well. I've been to other cities, other countries. I've been really lucky. I've traveled quite a lot during my career. Um, so, and I've also experienced the, uh, joy of being interviewed for different articles and different magazines, which is great. It's good exposure, especially when I had my own company. And, uh, this is an article quite some time ago, actually, from, uh, the magazine, the BIDA, as they were then called, produced about me and my work. Decorate 2017. Um, this was a, a really uh, fun experience. I'm uh, sorry about the image being really uh, a little bit um, grainy, but it was a photo shoot that we did at Cyan House, and uh, there was a number of different sort of prominent designers that were collected together, and we had this photo shoot, and it was done in two different days. So the sort of the half of the designers on this side in one day and then on that side another day and you can see there's Sophie Ashby there and there's Sue Timney, um, Luke Edward Jones, um, so uh, Luke Edward Hall sorry. Um, so a, quite a, an eclectic mix but uh, sort of loosely, very loosely based on The Last Supper. So I was really glad to be involved in that um, but again it's slight tokenism to it. Um, and uh, I was, that's something that I just want to sort of change, really. So, yeah, I've, I've had opportunities because I've put myself out there and I've enjoyed that. But I think there's some more that can be done. I've also te taught and lectured in various uh, practices and places like the interior design, uh, short courses, product design, BA, honours degree course, Institute of Marangoni, London Metropolitan University. Chelsea College, I'm a visiting tutor at the Interior Design School, Associate Lecturer at Central St. Martins, and then recently um, added to the advisory board for Plymouth University. So education has played a big part in my life, in my career, and I'm involved in education now, but education has given me the confidence that I think my siblings don't really have. Um, I also get involved in uh, cars and uh, vintage uh, clothing and things like that. So I have kind of a broad interest, but the main thing is my portfolio. When I was working as an interior designer, I had a company for um, almost 12 years and I worked with different designers. I worked on commercial and residential projects and um, it um, was a, a really exciting period because I was able to work with some fantastic clients doing uh, quite a wide range of projects. So I'm just going to go through these really quickly because there's quite a lot here and it would take forever to explain all of them. But just to give you a flavour of what I've been involved in really. Um, so anything from hot offices, hotels, houses, apartments, studios, clinics, furniture design as well. So it's really from 20, 2002 to 2013. I was founder and managing director of Simon Hamilton Interior Design. Then I rebranded to Simon Hamilton and Associates to attract more commercial clients. So it's mainly residential and then into commercial world. So 
the projects I worked on were generally from concept right through to completion, mainly in the UK, but I also worked on projects that were out of, out of the UK. So I'm um, just going to run through some of those so you can see the scope of work that I've been involved in and hopefully it give you a bit of background and context. As you can see, there's so many different jobs I've done. Yeah, space planning, um, floor plans for the vision clinic in Harley Street, hotel in Venice, all sorts of things, which has been fantastic. And apartment in Knightsbridge for some film producers. Really nice project that was. A house in Highbury, complete refurb, a four story house. Um, concept for a super yacht, one that was sustainable, so it used wind and uh, sun for power. Had to use really uh, sustainable products for that interior. That was never built, but it was a concept, so it's really interesting to be involved in something like that quite early on. I've done a lot of social media. Um, I worked as a studio manager for Matteo Bianchi Studio and uh, had no budget whatsoever, but I increased the followers from 600 to 1300 with no budget also responsible for other things other platforms as well and uh, that's some of the kind of work I did for Matteo and that's him with Marcel Wonders one of the big name designers in the world um, got uh, lots of articles for him as well and I've written a couple of uh, well I wrote a design book which is um, called Listen Design Inspire it was about Matteo Bianchi his creative journey he was a marketing expert and then went into interior design and so that book we launched it in Milan in 2018 and I, I wrote that that was like a about year and a half project and I've also been invited to be an, a guest author for another book so writing is something that comes quite easily to me I don't know if I'm any good but um, it's something I really enjoy so I've been able to do quite a lot in my career over the years and it's interesting that I feel that I'm the only one who's been doing this in my kind of, you know, demographic, if you like. Um, I've done lots of reports on trends and different design shows. I've traveled to different places like Stockholm and Paris and London and Milan to go to these different shows. And that's something also I've enjoyed. Um, you know, there's some of these events which are fantastic um, in Milan and in London and all over the place. You see all the new products, you see about a year ahead of the time. So it's great, really good exposure. But it's just weird that I don't get to meet other designers that are non-white. So the question really is what can we do to change this? Um, I'm just gonna stop sharing now so I can actually look at everybody and um, you can see me. Um, so I have, uh, this year has been quite incredible. I mean, not for the obvious reasons, but for um, in terms of collaborating, connecting with people and talking about this more in depth with people. And I think because we've all had time to review and to reflect, there have been different connections going on that I, I don't think I would have had if we hadn't had a lockdown and then people had been stuck in their homes and then discovering zoom i didn't even know about zoom before this um, pandemic arrived um and what's been great is that there's there are people that have contacted me that i think would never have been in touch with me if they hadn't had the time to or they've been traveling and they've been busy and they've been doing other things but because they have been a, a, a sort of a pause and a reset there's been um, consideration that hasn't happened before, which I think is fantastic. It's really, really good. And it really kind of kicked off with um, a podcast. I was invited to take part in a podcast, which was all about the lack of diversity in interior design. And it wasn't something that I thought was a really big issue until I started um, speaking to other designers and finding out what their experiences were. 
and it's great that now people feel comfortable to talk about it and I am involved in lots of different areas of it now and I think that that's something that Freehold could embrace as well and I have some examples of what's happening so maybe these are some things that people might want to kind of find out a little bit more about. Um, I'll share my screen again so you can see um, what I'm talking about. Um, the different incentives and initiatives that are going on. I think the first thing that is really important is to, like we do, we celebrate. Uh, we come together of all different shapes, sizes and everything. And I really want to continue that. And um, yeah, I happen to be gay, but it's not the main thing that kind of brings us together. It's, it's all about inclusion and equality, whether I'm male, female, whatever. Um, and I think that's something that I really want to continue. So what I would say is this is what we should, we can and we should be doing together is recognize, communicate, have empathy, get involved, integrate, collaborate, be creative and um, become mentors. Um, and with these ideas in mind, I have become involved with different organizations, been given opportunities, um, been uh, invited to be on podcasts. And I think those things, those things didn't happen before. I'm really glad they're happening now. And uh, I think there's more scope for that. And it's really, really exciting. So I've got some examples of that. One of the first things I did, I was invited by Nikki Lyle of Nikki Lyle Creative to be a contributor to her industry leaders series, which was uh, back in May. And that was fantastic. And it's um, on YouTube. And it's basically an interview with me talking about what I have done and also how I can advise designers on what I'm doing at the moment, which is as a design career consultant. So I'm advising designers about their CVs, about their portfolios, about interviews, etc. And Nikki was one of those people that was a real catalyst in making that happen for me. And um, that's fantastic. You know, she's somebody I used to work with and we have a really good relationship for the she's kind of on her own path and doing really really well and that was great to be involved in that and that was the first thing and that was in may and since then i've been involved in the great indoors podcast i wasn't really aware of them and um these are two white women who are uh straight but have loads of energy loads of ideas really respected interior design and they contacted me and they wanted me to be part of their podcast which is all about diversity and inclusion or the lack of it in design and you can listen to that podcast which is uh, broadcast in june and some of it is quite upsetting considering we're in 2020 and there's people that are going through really horrible situations um so a big thanks to them sophie robertson and um, Kate Watson Smythe for inviting me to that and Daniel Hopwood who was one of the uh, a very respected designer who invited me and put my name forward to that um, and then the interior design business uh, they have a podcast they have lots of listeners and that's Susie Rumbold and Jeff Hayward they have been running this for quite some time um, they did another podcast which is also about diversity so there's a lot of discussion a lot of talk out going out there which is absolutely brilliant really interesting and i've have connected with and met um online virtually with other black designers that i didn't even know existed so that is why the title of this whole talk is where is everybody every time i've been to a show or an event i've never seen other black designers i know they exist and now it seems that people are having a voice and a platform which is brilliant um united in design um diversity in action this is a charity that's been set up by Sophie Ashby and Alexandria Dawley and they hadn't even met but they get on like a house on fire we're actually having an AGM this Friday and they've set this up to again address the lack of design opportunities for mainly black or non-white um, kids pupils students etc and it's all about apprenticeships and um, mentorships and what they've done is created this charity and I'm part of this and it has really, really taken off. Sophie Ashby is a very well-known um, interior designer and top 100 in House and Garden and Alexandria Dawley 
is also a very good designer and well known too. So there's a lot going on, and they've been in Forbes magazine, they've been in the Times, they've, I think they've even been in Vogue, um, and it's really bringing people together, which is what I was talking about. Integration, collaboration is absolutely fantastic. So I'm helping them on the resource side in terms of the career advice that they're gi giving to people that apply, and what they've set up is. Uh, a sort of platform that companies can sign up to and they will then give an opportunity to somebody who would not necessarily get into interior design. They thought they would have about 50 people signing up. I think they've got at least 150 companies now. It's actually fantastic and doing really, really well. Um, here's some more information about it. Charitable organisations set up to address the lack of diversity within the interior design industry. Um, and they have a pledge which is driven by a clear need to de deliver an equal opportunity pathway for entry into interior design. And that's for black, Asian, ethnic minority, socio-economically disadvantaged backgrounds. So it's really good that things are being done. It's not just about talk, people are actually having action, which is fantastic. And um, I'm the person that deals with the resource hub, which is really a sort of portal and it's the uh, career side of it. And it's the, guidance that people need about CVs, about how to prepare their portfolios and, and the, the world of work. As I've been in design for so long, I'm somebody that can give that advice and really enjoy doing that and sharing it. So yeah, you can see my part on their website as editor and content curator. And that's it. I just want to say thank you. Um, I'm not sure if I've been waffling on too long and uh, I'm going to stop sharing now, but uh, hopefully there might be one or two questions. Let's see, in the, the, let's see, I think there's a question here. Okay, there's a question oh, from Nicholas Eyre. <laughs> um, okay, why do you think the BAME people have been so up with it? unrepresented in the interior design sector are more BAME individuals studying design these days. I would say, Nicholas, that um, they haven't necessarily been given the opportunities and the exposure. I've been very driven to talk to people, to get my name out there, to run my company, to go to events. And I think that maybe there's been um, a lack of confidence I, I got a lot of confidence from actually going to it, those events, but also because of my education. Um, I think that um, having a very positive um, um, education and a very supportive education really helped me. So um, I'm, I think that's maybe why there's less people from those kind of demographics that are not getting into interior design and also maybe it's not something that they feel appeals to them um maybe there are other sectors and other industries that they've been told maybe by their parents or their peers that they think oh no you should get into athletics no no maybe you should get into music because those are the things where black people do well but actually you know there's a lot of creative black people so um i think that's part of it um and then a question from kelly hi simon You've been on your own in rooms full of white people all your career. Is there anything you wish they had done to make you more included? I would say that maybe just acknowledging me because some of the times it's felt quite lonely and it's not something that I've, I've dwelt upon, but looking back at various events I've been to and I've been to different ones in different countries and I felt like, I'm the only one there. Whereas now I don't feel that. I think because everyone's talking about it, I feel that, um, yeah, there are lots of other black designers that I didn't even know about because I had not read about them in a magazine. I hadn't seen an article, an interview with them. I hadn't seen them on a, a panel discussion. And it's a visibility thing. So it's not that they don't exist. It's that they haven't been given a platform. Um, so I think, yeah, that's perhaps um, uh, a reason that you know, that's happened and yeah, I think they could include us more. How do you think the LGBT community can get behind the Black Lives Matter movement? Ooh. Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> Anonymous attendee. Um, 
again, I think it's about understanding what that means um, and not just jumping on the bandwagon, but uh, finding uh, a way to be part of that movement that means something. And I've always been a little bit wary of the black community in a way because I've been attacked, you know, homophobic attack from a black person. Um, and you know being gay and being black is also something that has been quite difficult and um, so I've felt more welcomed by non non black community I've been in a very middle class kind of background I suppose in society and um, so yeah I think that's something that could change if you could speak to somebody like David Mann if you could speak to the 10 year old Simon what advice would you give him um, be yourself I think 10 that's quite young really i hope that's a good answer and Bree stevens hall what would be your three hours of white leaders in our sector if they promised to run with anything you suggested i would say um collaborate and communicate and find out how you can work with people that are not in a majority that's what i would suggest chloe Odes, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct. Do you feel you've had, you've had you have had to be super resilient to achieve what you have in a pre predominantly white industry? Yeah, I've had to be resilient. Definitely, I have definitely um, felt that some of the opportunities that are out there have not been um, given to me, and sometimes I feel that that's been unfair. I wasn't always aware that it was because of race. I thought maybe because I wasn't um, of the right skill level or ability, or I wasn't actually uh, somebody who was climbing the ladder and aware of um, opportunities as, um, as much as other people. Whereas I think I'm a bit more savvy now. So I think experience has come a bit late or knowledge of that sort of thing. But I, I know myself a lot better now. Andre Kappelhoff. Um, hi, Simon. There's also some organisations that you could find useful for networking purposes, such as fame and property worth looking up. Thank you very much. That's good to know. And another question. Are there any types of projects you still really want to do? I'm actually not going to be doing interior design anymore, um, only for myself and my partner. And um, that's going to be in the south of France. So... Yeah, I've always wanted to design the interior of an aircraft. Um, that would be amazing because I love flying. So that would be one one question I would have liked to, one project I would have loved to have done. Luke Stevens, Kundal. Is classism rather than an inherent bias against race is at the root of the lack of diversity in professional service in the UK? If so, what steps might address that? Yeah, I think you're right. Class plays a big part in that, Luke. And I've experienced that even recently i've been to chelsea harbour and that's the uh, sort of center where there's lots of design showrooms and suppliers and in the past i really want, felt i wanted to fit into that group of people and i don't and i never will and i live in east london but i straddle the sort of clark and well group of designers and the chelsea group of designers they're very different although we're doing the same thing and producing, you know, beautiful interiors, et cetera. Um, and yeah, class definitely comes into it because I don't speak with a South London accent and I'm sort of, um, I suppose, uh, not posh, but I'm, I'm not common. People will engage with me and I've certainly experienced that in other countries. When I was in Australia, for instance, but then as soon as I spoke and they realized that I was English they were really lovely to me because I wasn't an Aborigine so I've experienced racism in all sorts of different ways um, which is unfortunate so yeah class does play a big role in that I'm not sure how you address that I think it's breaking down class barriers really um, and they are more established I would say in the UK we're more aware of class and status and that sort of thing than in other countries so that's something that maybe society has to address. Um, there's a question in the chat asking what the major difference that education gave you between you and your siblings and how that has manifested in social engagement. Yeah, that's a big question. Basically, 
because I went to a different school and different schools, there were still state schools, not private. I had lots of encouragement. I, I was given opportunities. Um, we had a careers convention. I remember meeting an interior architect and she was really enthusiastic. She was American. She was saying what she did. And I, my sister at the time was living in San Francisco and I was encouraged by that. And my brothers and sisters didn't have that. They didn't have a careers convention. They didn't have um, a, a situation where they were given a platform to say, oh yeah, this is what you can do. And so when I was at school and I did my O levels and then I did my A levels, it was just automatic that I was going to go to university. Um, and my brothers and sisters didn't seem to have that as a, a natural pattern. So I feel that education played a huge part in my uh, start in life and also the way I feel about um, other people and communicating and socializing and being put myself forward and traveling I don't feel that I'm limited I don't have barriers and well there are those barriers but I don't um, recognize those as limitations I, I go for things and I try things and I um, I experiment and I'm very, very, very sociable and it has given me confidence. So I think it's definitely changed the way I see myself and my life and my life. I think it's quite different to my brothers and sisters and they're all older than me, but I feel more confident than them in certain situations. Um, Dave Vernon, you're obviously very comfortable in your own skin, but me as a white male who came out at 46 working, uh, let's see, um, what advice would you give to individuals? First, small steps to gaining more confidence and being themselves at work. Wow. Um, I would say you need to kind of find people that you can connect with trust in your company and um, have lunch with them, spend time with them and talk to them about your life other than at work. I think that's the key thing. I've always made good friends from wherever I've worked and people that I've worked with 20 years ago are still good friends of mine because we just connected on a certain level, whether it's about. And I think that's a good way to get to know people that you work with. And then for you build up a sort of trust with them. Sometimes I've been let down and I've lost friends generally because they're not okay with me being gay and the, the whole black thing didn't even come into it. It was the, um, homophobia, which is kind of masked in some ways. But I think that was a long time ago and that wouldn't necessarily happen. I now work with people that I enjoy their company and that's because I, I feel, yeah, as you say, comfortable in my own skin. But it's taken me a long time, um, a very long time. And I would say that I have more white friends than non-white friends. But that, again, has been my, that's probably been my issue with black society in that I've not felt confident about integrating into black society. And it's also possibly because my parents weren't that positive about my, you know, my sexuality. So that held me back in that respect. Whereas my uh, white friends or, or colleagues never judged me on that at all. Um, I don't know if that's every question, um, hopefully. David, uh, Simon, that's brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a, a real whistle stop to her. <laughs> yes, it's quite quick, isn't it? <laughs> and your incredible achievements as well. Um, thank you for sharing so much with us. No pleasure. Um, I think it's really interesting you saying uh, we really need to listen. Um, and there's that role of collaboration. And uh, just the fact that there's so much going on and creating the same area from people that aren't necessarily in themselves, that, that really feels the game changer at the moment. Yeah. That we're now in, a, in an environment where people are creating change because they, they want equality, they, they want everybody to be the same, they want the same yeah. opportunity. I am curious though, and this is part of my day job, but I am curious about how we tell young people about these careers, because that seems to be the, the real blocker that we can get, how do we get people to recognise that this is a, a career option yeah. and such opportunities, 
Um, but equally, how do we keep them in the profession? Um, maybe that's a conversation. Yeah, for but time. what part of United in Design is doing is actually um, because they, they, they're going to become like an official charity in January. It takes quite a long time to set it up. But in the meantime, what they're going to be doing is going to schools and literally having people like myself and other people from the uh, main committee going to schools and saying, look, do you realise that there's a profession out there called interior design? You can get involved in it. You don't have to be posh. You don't have to go to a fancy school. You don't even have to be great at art. You just have to know about it. And if you're interested, we can help you. And there are different companies that will offer you either apprenticeships or internships and mentoring. And so that's, I think, the start is to give kids, like really young kids, uh, the knowledge yeah. and then when they get older they can make those decisions oh yeah I want to go into design and also realize that if you're an interior designer it doesn't mean you just design houses you could end up designing the interior of a Jaguar um, or a, a seven triple seven or seven eight seven or you know interior design is so broad and there's a lot of different ways that you can use it and we all get affected by it not to buy homes but in shops and 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 um airports and train stations and things like that so it's a huge huge industry um but it's it's been slightly tainted by media because people think oh it's just a bit of wallpaper and a few cushions <laughs> which some of it is <laughs> and there's the fun part of it but you know we we all kind of get um affected by the environment we're in so i think that's how we can do it it's it's through education i'm getting more involved in education i love it it's one of the best things i've ever done and most rewarding things I've ever done is being a tutor whether it's a visiting tutor part-time tutor whatever and I kind of wish I'd got involved earlier on um, so maybe that's what I tell my 10, 10 year old self is education is the thing get into it and, and you can give back um, and that's what universities I think you know universities as a question from Andre Kapelhoff um, universities are trying to do more and um, I think they're having a very difficult time anyway because you know they 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 rely a lot on an international market and there's some people who don't want to come to the UK because of COVID and all sorts of things. So uh, yeah, it's going to be an uphill struggle, but they are trying to do that. Brilliant. Well, thank you. So I think the, the takeaway from that is to create change, we've got to get involved. Yeah. Yeah. And collaborate. I'm a big one for collaboration. I I'm somebody that I know that, you know, I've designed lots of things, but it's never been on my own. It's always been a team effort. Um, and uh, if you can find people that you work well with, then that's half the problem solved. Brilliant. Thank you so much. No, it's been a real pleasure. Thank you. Just before everyone goes um, and, and leaning on that, that get involved, um, if, you've, if this has sparked a bit of curiosity in you, um, get in touch with us we're running this series so we'd like to hear more from our membership or our members um, and tell us what you're passionate about what you want to create change in uh, well you can contact us info at lgbt.com and so drop us a note and we'll we'll get in touch also just to let you know keep an eye on your inbox because we've got a few emails coming out in particular we're looking for some volunteers uh, and around the board so keep an eye on that um, other than that, I think that's everything. So have a wonderful evening and thank you all so much for joining us.